Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us today for our program called COVID-19 and Rare Disease Patients. Over the next hour, we're going to examine what's at stake for nearly 30 million Americans living with rare diseases. We'll explore the critical scientific research landscape they rely on and the impact of the pandemic on this community and this research. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Harmony Biosciences, for supporting today's really important and interesting conversations. Nearly one in 10 Americans today is living with a rare disease. More than 90% of these illnesses currently lack an FDA-approved treatment. For many, access to treatments and breakthrough developments from clinical trials can mean the difference between life and death. How has the pandemic impacted Americans living with rare diseases, especially as clinical trials have slowed or become more difficult to conduct? And how are scientific and medical communities prioritizing rare disease research amid competing health concerns? And what can Congress do to ensure disruptions and access barriers don't undermine research and don't undermine treatment progress? We're going to be putting all these questions and more in front of our fantastic speakers. But first, a, new, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us at, at the Hill events. And more importantly, use the hashtag, hashtag the Hill Rare Diseases. We're broadcasting live and we'll take your questions throughout the program. As with any live stream, you could experience occasional trouble with the video. Don't throw away your computer. Don't throw it out the window. Just refresh the page. They tell me that'll fix your problem. Uh, I am very hopeful it does. My first guest is Congressman Josh Gottheimer from New Jersey. He's made rare disease innovation a real priority on Capitol Hill and recently sponsored legislation called Cameron's Law to encourage greater investment in researching and developing rare disease treatments. I spoke to him a short while ago. Let's take a listen. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, me, I, I, I think the rare disease area is one that's very interesting. I have known uh, people who have, uh, and their children who have suffered from various rare diseases, and it's one of the most lonely and frustrating challenges a parent can have, um, or anyone can have, because there's so little infrastructure, uh, so little kind of smart economics, you know, behind it. And, and I really empathize. I'm so happy The Hill is doing this program today. I'm also kind of blown away by you in the fact that you brought Annette Leo, a mother of two sons, she has rare disease, who have rare diseases, your guest to the State of the Union address in 2019. So you put a human face on this. Uh, and, and you're also a champion for a six-year-old guy named Cameron Hyman. Can you tell us uh, uh, a little bit about how you got into this field and about the human side of what we're talking about today? Well, you know, and I, I the fact that you said and started with exactly the right comment that you know, you've got 30 million people who live with some form of rare disease, 90%, we don't have any cure for them, right? And, and so it's a lonely, it's often a lonely place and a really hard place, uh, obviously not just for the person with the rare disease, but with their, for their family, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and who are their caretakers um, and caregivers. Uh, so, you know, I, I um, my mom, believe it or not, had a uh, rare disease um, we lost her a few years ago and, um, uh, you know, they knew a little bit more about her rare disease than some others, but not much. And, um, uh, and it was really frustrating because you kind of knew there was no cure. Uh, and what you hoped for was that there was enough incentives for, for those in the R and D space, you know, our phenomenal life sciences companies and all of our scientists to actually wanna and be able to afford to invest in cures and finding mm -hmm. cures. And the challenge I, I discovered pretty fast was that unless we help them in some ways to do it, it's just it, it's prohibitively expensive to, to research a lot of these rare diseases, right? And, and that was a huge challenge and one that I immediately decided to start tackling when I got into the Congress. Well, tell us a little bit about Cameron and Cameron's law. Um, does it fix the, the financial problem? Well, well, part of it, believe it or not, years ago, and it was under um, President Reagan, that we first came up with uh, orphan drug tax credit. And, um, uh, you know, and, and more than 770 new medicines have been approved over the years from the tax credit, which is really just an incentive to some of our life sciences companies to make those investments. You help, you help them pay for it, right? To help pay for that research. And what happened in 2017 in the tax bill, we actually cut it in half from 50% to 25% coverage. 
um, which to me was inhumane that you would actually cut this tax credit to, that incentivizes some of this discovery. So I've met several families in my district over the years now, especially as I started to speak out about the importance of investing in rare diseases, which as you know, often lead to finding all these other cures, right? So you, one thing leads to another. We saw this by the way with COVID, right? That some of the things we had done the research for then led us to actually uh, other discoveries, which ultimately led to the vaccine. And right, right. It, wasn't, it wasn't if most of that research that had been done wasn't actually to, to beat COVID-19. It was for other, right? It was for other things that we done. Well, you're building on, on science and taking advantage yeah. of, you know, other things. It's usually, you know, I tell people most progress is not earnestly achieved. It's done through bank shots, you know? You exactly. know? So, so I, you know, and, and, it, and it raised another interesting question. You know, I think, look, I mean, I get my metaphors all wrong on this stuff, but I sort of feel like the FDA and the you know corporations and the science and research community are kind of like all dancing together. Sometimes the dance goes well, and sometimes it's really crappy. And and we've had COVID in two years, and the COVID has really, in the rare disease area, disrupted the process by which research occurs, clinical trials occur, a lot of clinical sites close down. Now some things happen in you know response. We got telehealth, we got home visits because you've got to have a community of people who who are in fact afflicted with a disease, which becomes a community of concern and a community of research. But if you can't connect them, you can't meet the clinical end trials of the FDA. I'm just interested in whether or not there are pieces of that you think we could focus on. I want to tell folks, you know, Josh Gottheimer is not only kind of Mr. Bipartisan and problem solver in Congress, you were problem solver at Microsoft. Like you understand companies and information and how you kind of bring together complex systems. Do we need to do something to the complex system of how we do drug research in this area? Well, you're, you're spot on the fact that during COVID, because of COVID, we had to stop a lot of our clinical research. So it set back a lot of um, our ability to keep moving forward. Now we're going to get some of those trials, I'm hoping, back going again. But that put a big freeze on a lot of this research, which is not good. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the the Leos in in my district and uh, which are people who, who the, you talked about the State of the Union um, um, a, a couple of years ago, Annette Leo, we, she was my guest, the mom and two kids, Nick and Matt. Un unfortunately, we lost Nick um, from from complications of um, of his disease, uh, rare disease um, uh, last year at the age of 23. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, wonderful, like what too wonderful. You, you will never meet two people with a bigger heart. But if we don't actually get back on this, on going after these rare diseases and using this ingenuity where and, and taking chances, you have to be willing to take shots on goal and fail. That's how this whole thing works. And my fear is if we don't incentivize it and we don't do everything we can to encourage our great life sciences companies to take those shots on goal, we will never discover, the, you know, we'll never find the next cure. And that to me is what is, you, when you talk to these families, so frustrating. So I've been pushing very hard to reinstate this tax credit to get that 50% back to allow those investments to occur again. It's very, very important. We've got the greatest life sciences companies in the world here. You know, sometimes people, as you know, are critical of our great companies and it drives me crazy. A lot of them are based in Jersey, our great companies, right? That that have dis that make these discoveries, right? Like like for what the, for the vaccine, we should, and what we learned from MNRA, we should be celebrating all of this research instead of taking shots at, at these at these great scientists who who come up with these discoveries. So, you know, Steve, there's one thing I'd say is we got to actually get the incentives back and we have to build up any every system possible to encourage us to take these chances so that we can so that we can have the next discoveries like we have. Well, you know, I've been following, I understand the logic of the tax credit side, but one side of, you know, in, in anticipation of talking to you, I called a couple of you know, the players in this research in rare diseases. And I said, you know, what really matters? What's hit you during COVID? And yeah. they said, look, the FDA is really trying to work with us, trying to find ways to be nimble and deal with the fact that our way of doing, you know, trials and research yeah. has been yeah. impacted and affected. But what hasn't changed is the clock, that there's a clock and you get exclusivity for so, so long as I understand it. And, you know, this is kind of like an exogenous shock, act of God, COVID comes in and hits us, no fault of any particular player everybody's adjusting but it seems to me and look i may be getting something real wrong here folks so if i am yeah. i'm sorry why not just like put pause on the clock and you know, you know that's not a budgetary thing it's like in this area of rare diseases in which the dynamics of the economics are so fragile 
why not stop the clock until after you know the COVID crisis ends and then oh, we you're start saying you're saying the clock on the clock on exclusivity so that the drug on, research on they're doing right. and what they're doing and investing right. in they don't get any extension of that exclusivity in this time period but they've lost a you know pretty significant amount Which, of time. By the way, seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, what you're saying. I'm just like going to what what can you do a non budgetary exactly. way it seems to, to make a lot, yeah no it seems to make a lot of sense to me in fact that's kind of what I was getting at before. Well, if you yeah. want to call it the Gottheimer bill. Rather than Clemens, but you're welcome. I'll name it after you, Steve. I mean, I, I I think you know the we should be looking at any which way we encourage investment in these rare diseases. So if what you're hearing, um, and and what I've heard is more of the frustration that we've had to actually stop a lot of the research. Um, mm -hmm. You're bringing up another angle to this, which I'm I'm really going to look into right away, which is the okay because we've actually had to stop a lot of the research, we should also stop the clock on, on taking away exclusivity. That makes a lot of sense too. I mean, anything we do that disincentivizes investment in these rare diseases to me is a huge negative and hurts the families like, like that we named Cameron's Law after. Um, and Cameron is this wonderful woman, young little girl in, in my town um, that I live in, you know, who, who um, right, is, is battling a rare disease and, and, and San Filippo um, uh, syndrome. Uh, you know, we, we have to, I, I, so I love that idea. And if that's actually what's mm. going on, which I have not heard from the advocates about, but I'm going to immediately do research on it. If that's what's going on, then certainly that's something that we should pursue right away. I mean, the FDA in a lot of ways, as you know, is frustrating. So I'm going to offer ways of fixing it. Josh, there's another element here. And again, you know, I'm uh, back in metaphor land, you know, Dr. Seuss, but I'm not sure I should mention Dr. Seuss, but there's that, you know, great cartoon in the past, you know, you know, we're here, we're here. And I right. sort of feel like the rare disease area is sort of like that. We're here, we're here, we're matter. You know, people have, you know, some sliver fall within some of the ranges of, of rare diseases. Rare disease has hit 10, 10%, one in 10 of Americans, but yet this does not get the airtime, does not get the attention. I'm glad we're doing this at the Hill. I care about the subject, but the truth is it still lays at the fringe of many of the discussions that we talk about on the health side. And I'm just interested in whether or not there's some sort of, you know, I mean, this is unfair to you, but you're, you know, you're a political uh, conceptualizer. What can be done to bring this topic less from the fringe, less from, you know, the, the, that elephant who's trying to say, hey, I'm here, I'm here. And then, you know, kind of, you know, make it more substantial in terms of the attentions that we should be giving the aggregate number of Americans who are afflicted with this kind of thing and kind of create a greater structural presence. Is that a fair question? It's a very fair question. I mean, and Fred Upton, who's the co-sponsor of, of uh, my bill with me, we, we talk about this. Like, how do you actually put this front and center? Because uh, to your point, Steve, everyone knows somebody who's dealing with it. When you have 30 million Americans, everybody knows somebody, right? And um, um, what I think we need to do, and the advocates do a great job on this, but they're also very busy taking care of people, right? <laughs> Often. Yeah, yeah. So it's up to us to put this front and center and to make sure we say, you, here's why you should care. You may not know somebody with a rare disease, but by the way, look at all the other diseases or challenges we've solved because of what we've learned in a rare disease. And thank God for the discoveries we came up to. And you got to make this personal for people. And I, I've learned this, right? This is, you know, to your point, how, how does this affect your life? Um, and thank God, wait, how many people came up to you and said, it's amazing what we did on the, on the vaccine, right? I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, you know, and, and of, of what we did in a short period of time, as frustrated as we are, we came up with a solution. And it's all because of this. And I think this is why we need to actually show people, if you pull back from this, if you don't incentivize it the right way, the next, we're not solving the next disease. We're not going to be prepared for the next pandemic. And that's why I think it could be tied nicely to that. Okay, you know, another area of interest, and again, I have no complaints or criticism of the NIH, and Francis Collins is stepping down. I'm just wondering if not, if there isn't a, a, an opportunity here to ask ourselves what's missing in the research area. You know, there's money, you've got a lot of this industry in your, in your district. But I remember when then Vice President Biden launched the cancer moonshot. Yep. The shtick he had of that was that there were more silos than people knew in the research area on cancer. And that we're going to put dissimilar players, you know, from the information industry and SAP and Microsoft in the room with, you know, cancer clinics and cancer centers. And somehow the synergy of that would matter. And I remember when I first met you at the 
Microsoft Science Fair years ago, and you'd go see these really brilliant innovations that had nothing to do with what Microsoft was doing. They were all outside. Whether or not there isn't an opportunity here to say, hey, with the private sector, let's begin looking at some of these other side players who've innovating in different ways and begin looking. Because you know, when I when I look at the rare disease area, it's, a, it's an economic problem because you have small scale. Um, small incidents, serious impact on people's lives, but the way our economy, it doesn't scale well. But in a world of information, in, in a world of personalized medicine and kind of zeroing in on people and the efficiency you get out of the information, isn't there something we could be doing or thinking about differently in this area that we might not have done so before? I mean, I, you, you're making such an important point, which is how do we uh, how do we bring these worlds together that are doing both doing so much and change and, and helping change the world so fast, how do we actually bring them together? And you're right, you know, the, the president has talked about the cancer moonshot again. He's been talking about it lately. I think they did something at the White House mm. a couple of weeks ago on it. And, and there's, I've got a piece of legislation that I'm working on. Actually, Brian Fitzpatrick and I have are working on childhood can have worked on a childhood cancer bill that's out there. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be bringing together the Microsofts and the the Googles and the of the world that are and all these frankly all the, there's lots of companies doing AI that are really cutting edge and using all this mass information and trying to apply it in a different way now with with our life sciences and uh, it's amazing if we actually gave that a shot and worked together instead of against each other what we could probably pull off uh, and and the people I got to meet when I used to work at Microsoft these scientists and people working on things I mean even during COVID. One of the engineers from Microsoft called me and they had this heat map of where it was breaking, of where the outbreaks were, by like community. And it was looking at the data in a way I brought it to our governor. I said, look at this data, like, what, you know, that, um, uh, you know, that we hadn't really ever, that we're not looking at COVID in this certain way. You could cut it and you could try to figure out where, where it's coming next. We should be, that was just because using all the, the power of, of a certain uh, tool that Microsoft has and, you know, but all these companies have, and we should be bringing them to you, to your point, we should be deploying them. Uh, and, and uh, you're, you're right. We're, we're not doing it enough. And that's the only way we're going to solve some of these problems. I met some the other day, you know, there's this new test for cancer, which is, uh, have you heard about this new diagnostic test they've come out with? And you, you literally um, it, it's, it's, it looks at DNA. It, you send blood out and it can detect up to 70 different cancers that we don't have screening for, including, wow. uh, right? So it's it's a whole new thing. The, the president actually talked about it, but then I met with them, they explained it to me. It's pretty amazing. Um, and we're trying to see if we can get it covered so that other people can can take it. But but those are the kind of evolutions that we're having that only come out if we actually put our mind to it. Well, it's really fascinating to hear. Look, March 1st is coming up, which is gonna be the pres president's State of the Union address. Uh, again, I'm gonna be up there in the hall somewhere listening. Uh, yeah. You're going to have guests again. You're gonna, what, well, who are you going to invite this year? I think they're not letting us have guests. Oh, oh, that's right. That's a bummer. That's, My no, apologies. I just yeah, of course be, not. I just want to be able to go. You know, so they told us that we're allowed to go, which, by the way, um, that's a change from the year before. So I'm very happy about that. Um, uh, so unfortunately, we're not going to have. We can't have guests this year. Yeah, well, I will be in the in the hall up there, so I'll wave as well, you walk kind of by. You'll be my guest. Yeah, well, well, I, I'll actually be working, and and maybe I'll, I'll I'll put a microphone in front of you. Well, well, Congressman Josh Gottheimer of New Jersey, Thanks, uh, member of the Financial Services Committee, the Homeland Security uh, Committee, but you know, I think very importantly, uh, he is co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus right. and a real leader on these issues we're talking about today in rare disease. So, Josh, thank you so much for great joining to see us. You. Have a great one. Okay, good to see you. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>